Honorable Emma Theophilus, Executive Director at the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf Presidential Center for Women in Development, Oli Diba Wada, and Vice President of Colombia, Francia Elena Marquez Mina. Hello, give our panel a hand. Hey, Global Black Economic Forum. Good morning. Let's all take a seat. Well, welcome to this session. I'm Dr. Nicordelai Corte. I'm honored to be here. Uh, you just heard a moment ago that I have a new book coming out, Kamala, The Motherland and Me, coming out July 23rd. And one of the things that Vice President Harris said when I had a chance to cover her in Africa last spring, um, we were in Ghana, we were in Zambia, we were in Tanzania, and she reminded us at every stop that by 2050, one in four people on the planet will live in Africa. She reminded us that the average age on the continent is 19 years old. She also reminded us uh, that two thirds of the folks with access to the internet on the continent are men, not women. Uh, and so, uh, I want to invite Madam Vice President of Colombia uh, to kick us off by telling us something we don't know about black people, Afro-Latinos in Colombia. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, es cierto que acá en los Estados Unidos poco se conoce de la población afrodescendiente, no solo en Colombia, sino en América Latina. Ayer les decía que eh, Colombia es el tercer país con el mayor número de población afrodescendiente en América Latina, en, en las Américas, incluyendo los Estados Unidos que tienen la primera, Brasil la segunda y Colombia es el tercer país con el mayor número de población, el 30% de la población colombiana es afrodescendiente, esto es casi 15 millones de afrodescendientes o afrocolombianos como nos identificamos. Una población que por supuesto reconoce su historia, reconoce su raíz, reconocemos que somos descendientes de personas que fueron traídas desde el continente africano en condición de esclavitud pero reconocemos nuestro papel en la independencia de Colombia y en la independencia que se hizo en América Latina. Por supuesto, reconocemos como colombianos el papel que jugó el pueblo haitiano en la lucha por la libertad en la región. Así hoy Haití esté pagando el precio y el costo de haber parido la libertad para la región. Eso implica un compromiso de la diáspora con la liberación, con devolverle la dignidad al pueblo haitiano y por supuesto Colombia, los afrocolombianos pues siguen viviendo en condiciones de eh, vulnerabilidad y por eso seguimos aquí haciendo nuestros esfuerzos desde el gobierno nacional para dignificar la vida de la población afrocolombiana, la vida de los más excluidos y marginados. El gobierno del cambio se plantea políticas de transformación para la justicia social y ello implica que si no se avanza en la garantía de los derechos de la población afrocolombiana, e indígena no se avanza en la garantía de los derechos de los colombianos. Thank you for that. So, We have a translator here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, well, indeed, here in the United States, perhaps little is known about people of African descent in Colombia and actually in Latin America as a whole. Well, you'd be interested to know that Colombia has the third largest population of African descent in the Americas, after the United States that come first, followed by Brazil. In Colombia, 30% of the population is of African descent. That's about 15 million people. 
This is a, a group of people that do recognize their history, their roots, and the fact that we descend from uh, people who were forcefully brought from Africa as slaves, and therefore um, who later recognized uh, their own role in the independence of Colombia, a role that we also recognize, and in the independence of Latin America. Uh, I'd also like to say that we're very aware of the role that um, Haiti has played in uh, the struggle for freedom on our continent, a uh, struggle they have paid a very high cost for. And uh, I'd like to um, reaffirm our commitment and the commitment that I believe should be that of the whole African diaspora around the world to give Haiti its dignity back. <laughs> now, um, the Colombians of African descent live in situations of vulnerability, which is why our government is deploying many efforts to give them back a dignified life uh, because they have been historically marginalized and excluded. Our government is therefore seeking a social transformation that will benefit not only marginalized people of African descent in Colombia, but also indigenous populations. Well, speaking of social transformation, we know a little bit about that here in the United States with all of the attacks on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I want to bring in Oli Dibawada uh, to uh, share with us a little bit about uh, uh, what sort of policy missteps, what sort of governance issues are hindering economic inclusion and the advancement of black communities globally through your work with the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf Center for Women and International Development? Um, thank you very much. I think uh, they're, they're, I'll, I'll pick on three. One of them is the issue of equity, um, which is very fundamental that um, uh, we struggle with um, as, as a misstep, equity and access to education, equity and access to resources, uh, particularly around land. Um, in Africa, that is a fundamental resource that is required. Um, women in Africa are mainly agriculturist and uh, they do not have access to land they do not own land and as a result they don't have access to collateral to be able to expand on their businesses uh, the other area is also on technology and education um, there's limited access to technology and education particularly for women and girls um, we've seen a lot of changes. I mean, the three of us sitting here is already a demonstration of what education can do for young women and girls. It's still limited, but I think fundamentally is also the component of skills and training. Not everyone is cut out for the classroom. And we also realize that the education system that is being taught in the schools does not have much benefits for these young women and girls in the world of work. So as a result, I think one of the discussions that we're having in the education architecture is to revisit the curriculum, to have an education system that resonates with Africa, for Africans, by Africans, that resonates with Africa's reality. So I think if we combine the access to education, the access to land and resources, and the, the access to equal opportunities um, will go a long way. And these are conversations that are happening now, but um, these are some of the things that um, we're struggling with. Thank you. Thank you. I want to bring uh, Emma Theophilus into the conversation. She knows a lot about Nam Namibia. You know a lot about what's happening across the diaspora. I want to pick up on that thread around technology. We know that here in the United States, uh, HBCUs like Morgan State University, any Morgan State alum here? Any HBCU alum here? Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, HU in the house, I hear you. Uh, we know that HBCUs like Morgan State University are growing their cybersecurity and artificial intelligence programs. Can you tell us something we don't know about how existing and emerging black leaders in tech are using technology and the promise of innovation to supercharge economic growth. Definitely, and thank you very much for having me on this panel. If I can pick up from what uh, Oli was talking about, education and technology. For Africans on the African continent, Africans in the diaspora, 
education is such a big fundamental part towards economic freedom. In Namibia, for example, we see a serious skills gap between emerging technologies and the current skill set we have in the workforce. And because of that, we are seeing such a bigger, bigger gap between you know, older men and young black women actually get into the same workforce. And if they do get into the same workforce, they hardly get to the top of the chain in actually advancing tech companies or advancing any companies being CEOs or board members or in, in top management. So we see the gap is widening and we can only close that gap if we actually increase skills development. But more than that, we are seeing that the solutions around tech in Africa are really meant to solve the challenges that Africans are facing. We're seeing, for example, that many parts of the continent, um, connectivity is a challenge because there's a lack of electricity and because there's a lack of electricity, we need to find innovative ways to actually create energy. So some of these tech companies are making it one affordable and accessible for average African citizens to have energy, which will then propel them to have access to technology. So some of the innovations are not, you know, um, big ideas. They're meant to solve everyday challenges that African people are facing. And because we have a growing number of Africans, of course, getting online, there is still an advanced stage of actually teaching citizens to be safe online, hence the cybersecurity element. Um, because many systems are allowing for many citizens to have financial literacy, to be able to hold bank accounts, to be able to transact online but not many know how to protect themselves. So many of the solutions are really meant to ensure that small businesses, medium enterprises, micro businesses are able to protect the dollars they have as they transact online, as they reach more markets outside their countries, outside the African region and into the world. Because of course, with technology, we are only one global village, but that requires some level of policy intervention, innovative ideas to ensure that they're actually able to safely transact online. Speaking of being a global village, uh, one of my favorite African proverbs is if we want to go fast, go alone. If we want to go far, go together. Uh, and uh, one of my favorite songs, Whitney Houston, Greatest Love of All, she says, teach them well and let them lead the way. Madam Vice President, what's your vision for the future of black global leadership and, and how do you see it shaping the economic landscape for black communities worldwide. Creo que las posibilidades y cómo yo visiono el futuro de la población afrodescendiente es a partir de el reconocimiento, de reconocernos, de conocernos y de trabajar en articulación. Las alianzas son fundamentales para avanzar pero sobre todo la participación es fundamental. Creo que hay que ocupar los espacios de poder en la música, de poder en la ciencia, en la tecnología, en la innovación, pero hay que ocupar los espacios de poder político. Sí, la representación política es importante y no es solo la presencia de la comunidad, sino que es la presencia de las mujeres. Es necesario garantizar la participación de las mujeres negras en espacios de toma de decisiones en favor de nuestras comunidades. Es lo que hemos hecho en Colombia. Soy la primera mujer afro que llega a ser vicepresidenta, pero espero que el camino no se quede aquí. Esperamos seguir abriendo las puertas para que otros jóvenes, otras mujeres puedan acceder. Esto es importante entonces desde una perspectiva de justicia racial. Hay, hoy hay discusiones globales que se están dando de cómo va a seguir funcionando el mundo, discusiones en términos de cambio climático, discusiones en términos de paz, de si nos aventamos hacia un mundo de guerras, y de conflictos armados o proponemos un mundo y un camino de paz. Hoy hay discusiones globales de justicia, de igualdad y ahí tenemos que participar, sobre todo porque a nivel global es la población afrodescendiente que si hablamos de cambio climático, la que vive los mayores impactos y consecuencias de 
el cambio climático, por las desigualdades e inequidades históricas. Si hablamos de ciencias, tecnologías e innovación, y esta ciencia no se usa en función de la vida, también los impactos de las ciencias, de la tecnología, pues desproporcionalmente van a impactar negativamente en la población. Y entonces incidir para que estas herramientas se usen de manera adecuada y en favor de la justicia, en favor de la vida, es parte de lo que tendríamos que hacer. Pero si hablamos de pobreza, ¿sí? los mayores niveles de pobreza a nivel global se expresan en la población afrodescendiente, en la población negra. Y entonces eso nos involucra a todos, nos obliga a tener agendas comunes, nos obliga a trabajar de manera articulada para poder transformar esas realidades. Por eso creo que este espacio es súper importante. No todo es malo, creo que hay grandes oportunidades y el venir aquí a este foro económico para discutir la situación económica global de la gente negra es una gran oportunidad porque tenemos que poner sobre la mesa las potencialidades y los, las oportunidades que podemos de manera conjunta crear en cada una de nuestras regiones, no importan las fronteras, pero si trabajamos de manera articulada, yo creo que vamos a poder transformar esa realidad y yo creo que no somos una minoría en el planeta, somos una mayoría y el número importa, así que tenemos que hacer que ese número pueda incidir en las decisiones globales que se están tomando y que afectan o benefician a la humanidad. Translation. So, um, indeed, I believe that the future for people of African descent will necessarily have to go through recognizing and knowing each other better at the global level. It will have to go through weaving partnerships and alliances so that we can all hear each other's voices among the diaspora worldwide through music, film, but also through science and technology and ventures in this field. Now, this is all fine, but let us not forget the political realm. The presence that we must show, the fact that we must occupy the political sphere is of utmost importance. And it's not only being there just for being there, but also being there to be seen and to make sure that it's not only just anyone in this space, but specifically women must be present in political spheres. Black women must be present and be heard in decision-making spaces at, at, at the global level. I'm the first vice president of African descent in Colombia, but I hope I won't be the last. And that the fact that I, I'm bl I am blazing this trail will allow other women like me to have access to such positions of power in the future. This is a matter of racial justice. Today, worldwide, many things are being discussed, fundamental aspects of the future of humanity regarding climate change, regarding whether we choose paths of peace or paths of war and armed conflict. We're discussing matters of justice and equality. We must be there. Our voices must be heard in those spaces. If you talk about climate change, for example, it's no secret that African, that, that black people and people of African descent throughout the world are suffering disproportionately of the consequences of climate change. So science and technology will hopefully be used in positive terms for the sake of life and for justice. Otherwise, the impacts of science and technology that is used wrongly will necessarily hit us disproportionately once again. So it's really in our hands to choose whether we want to use all these tools for life and for justice or for something else. Because poverty around the world is uh, suffered mostly by blacks and people of African descent. So we must bring our agendas together to transform. And this is why I think being here is so important. All these opportunities represent things that are not all bad. And we must make sure that we can tap on everything that's uh, available to us so that we can shape the discourse 
in, in the future. And this will allow us to change the situation that black people and people of African descent around the world are experiencing. Create a worldwide consciousness that there is a need to transform. I believe we are no longer a minority and numbers do matter in this debate. So let us be heard on the global stage. Mic drop, mic drop. I wanna, I wanna give Oli Dibawada and uh, Emma Theophilus an opportunity to uh, weigh in on this last question as we come to a close. Um, we know that next week is the NATO summit in Washington, D.C. I'll certainly be there uh, covering that. Uh, in light of uh, the upcoming NATO summit in Washington, D.C., how can black leaders influence, how can we increase our influence on the global stage, particularly in international organizations like the United Nations, like the African Union, like NATO, uh, how can we do that, and, and how can we increase our presence in multilateral negotiations? You want to kick us off, Oli? Yes, um, thank you very much. I think uh, there is a trajectory, there's a trend that is surfacing that we are ignoring, uh, and I'm looking at this from the African perspective, that... Um, when the Jasmine Revolution happened in Tunisia, we ignored, we realized what was happening and we ignored. And then SARS happened in Nigeria. And then we see what is happening in Kenya. And um, it's come to a point or a realization that we cannot talk about the future without the future sitting on the decision-making table. Um, the youths have agency they've decided that they're going to take their future in their own hands with or without us. Now, discussions on uh, NATO, discussions in the UN, discussions with the AU, these are all elements that were created not by Africans. Um, we know what happened with the OAU, we know how it was created. I think it is time for us you know, you talked about Whitney Houston and teach them well and let them use, um, see, use the way. I say, no matter where you come from, as long as you're a black man, you're an African. These boundaries, these invisible boundaries needs to be dismantled. We need to be able to communicate based on our colors without asking where do you come from um, and who are you? And I think um, while we can't live in isolation. We need to start having discussions together as our, 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 ourselves and also start engaging with ourselves because we can never pro um, progress if we are piggybacking on systems that have been developed to discriminate us. There's NATO, there is um, Sierra Leone is representing Africa. Um, how much power does Sierra Leone have on that decision-making table? I think it's time. We are the majority. The melanin is the one that owns this continent. We need to completely disrupt the disruptors and own our narrative, tell our stories, make our own decisions. Um, if we don't, the youths are taking over and they're doing things their own way. So I just wanted to to bring that, and I, I know it doesn't answer a lot of your a part of your question, but I just think that we need to start changing this trajectory. We cannot be having conversations in systems that were developed to oppress us. Thank you. Another mic drop, Emma. Yes, I, I want to build on what Ole is saying, and it does answer the question because the truth of the matter is, as people of African descent, those that live on the continent that we we'll left the continent, surgeries to go and live in other parts of the world. We need to come together and we need to know more about each other. It's not fair that I come to America and there are African Americans who still believe Africa is a country and not a continent. We must intentionally know about one another. We must know about the roots on the African continent. So it's important because whether it's in the Caribbean or in Colombia, in Latin America or other parts of the world, Africa is what unites all of us, the color of our skin brings us together. So we must be intentional 
about knowing each other and actually learning about one another. Hence why I live in Namibia, but I'm here because I understand that the Glo Global Black Economic Forum speaks to me as well as a black person, whether I live in the States or in Africa. But to answer your question, multilateralism today is something I'm disappointed in as an African leader. Why? Africa is one of the most populous continents on the, on the world, in the world, but we do not have a seat on the Security Council as a permanent member. Till today, when decisions are being made at the Security Council of the United Nations, Africa does not have a permanent seat, which means six, seven other countries around the world are making decisions about one of the largest continents in the world, and just because we are a continent of black people. Second of all, we're seeing the disparities in the response to wars. What happened in Ukraine, what's happening in Palestine, what's happening in Haiti. There's a silent genocide in the DRC. Millions of people are being displaced. We are seeing coup d'etats in West Africa. We are seeing what's happening in Sudan. Their response is nowhere close to the response in Ukraine. It is unfair. Multilateralism today is not working for black people because black people have no seat at the table where these decisions are being made, where resources are being channeled, and where their lives are being affected on a daily basis. Nowadays, we're talking about lithium. Namibia has lithium. DRC has lithium. But nowhere are we talking about factories being built on the African continent where this resource is coming from the ground and communities are being misplaced. Multilateralism is not working for the African continent. It's not working for black people because the racial justice that the VP of Colombia was talking about is true. We're still talking about reparations for African people. Right now in Namibia, we're negotiating with Germany. One, for them to accept that a genocide happened in 1904 to 1908, for them to apologize for the genocide and to bring back tens and thousands of skulls in German museums of Namibian descendants and Namibian ancestors where their descendants are sitting in Namibia without their heritage. So we must talk about the racial justice and we cannot do so when we do not have a seat at the table. So we must find a reform for these multilateral organizations where African lives are being decided on every single day. Thank you. Our thanks to the panel, to Vice President Francia Marquez, to Oli Dibawada and Emma Theophilus, thank you, thank you, thank you.